Um, I think, you know, both Emily and myself are really inspired by nature and natural systems. And, um, you know, I think we're also two people who spend way too much time sort of behind computers. Um, so I think with our kind of interactive environments, we're actually aiming to sort of find ways to use technology that um, really transforms the space and kind of brings that nature into a space. Um, but, it, you know, it isn't sort of pushing the technology up front. Like for us, it's exciting when the sort of technology is hidden behind and the effect is just like magic. Um, for myself, my biggest influence is probably science and nature. Um, you know, I, 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 there are, I mean, I don't know, there's not a lot of art there is some art that in inspires me, but I, th I have almost sort of this autistic quality where I kind of have a very hard time emotionally relating to art. But like for myself, like I can very uh, much emotionally relate to nature and really kind of be just kind of gobsmacked by what actually exists around us. And you know, if I ever think like you know we've managed to do something really cool or kind of highly technical, um, then you just sort of like watch some like undersea like deep sea documentary and you just kind of completely feel humbled, like you know because really what already sort of has been happening for millions of years is, is just far more complex and far more interesting than I think what sort of anyone sort of is attempting to do. And when? Once we kind of, it's a three-sided installation where uh, sort of an interactive forest with a, uh, water, a waterfall flowing through it. And when we had that sort of feeling that, you know, the water was like really, felt really like it was real water and you could kind of guide it and dam it and get it to the trees. And, you know, you got it to the trees and the trees would sort of bloom and come alive. Like that sort of moment when that, we saw that in, in the actual space, um, it, you know, even though we knew how it worked, for us it felt like magic at the time. And, you know, that was, that was a... Uh, yeah, it kind of is sort of the reason why you want to do this stuff because it kind of surprises you even though that's what you're intending for it to happen. Yeah. To do and that you can really actually design things that are, are very far out and kids just accept it. And, you know, they immediately like, oh yeah, sure, that makes sense, you know, and you know, just will run right in. Um, kids and it's also, you get this feeling like, you know, like these kids are going to grow up and they'll have this memory of this insane thing that they were interacting with when they were five. And that's just going to be normal for them. And that's sort of, you know, to kind of leave a mark on someone at that early age feels like it's a pretty special uh, opportunity. And did you have any experience? Some ha having the opportunity to have some really great professors there. Um, Golan Nevin was teaching at the time, and then in turn Zach Lieberman was uh, teaching, and uh, people like Marco Tanderfelt. Uh, and so just like trying to take as many of classes with those guys because, you know, you're just like, this is like a rare opportunity and to kind of you know, pick up on that early creative coding community. Um, and then since then, you know, I, I also was sort of addicted to the idea of being an inventor. And actually, like when I was 10, I thought that was going to be my job for the rest of my life was like to be an inventor and to invent, invent things. Um, but I don't know, I just like, I like the kind of power and the flexibility and the idea of being able to sort of think of something and then a few days later or maybe a few weeks later actually see that thing and you'd be like oh man like I remember when we were just sitting in that bar just like sketching that out on paper and now this thing really exists in the real world and I think that is like an addictive process I know when Emily um, so like with laser tag you know and even the iWriter project both of those things were sort of like sure, let's try that, but like, we have no idea if this is really even going to work. And then to sort of like a month later to see the thing, you know, kind of exceeding your expectations is definitely a kind of an addictive uh, drug in a way. Um, against the oh man, I don't know if enjoy is the right word. It's, uh, I think probably if you ask anyone who sort of does this stuff regularly, like, you know, you, all you want to be able to do is sort of have it working and be finished with it. And, you know, you do not want to be, you know, spending like, another night without sleep but you know on, in retrospect when you look back you're like oh yeah that was a great time you know that was awesome um, I think it's more the anxiety of sort of ne not knowing if if it will work or not and and you know that sort of stress that comes with that mm. so it's like and um, I think we're often very enamored with technology and um, it's not necessarily a bad thing but I think we're at, at this in this last 10 years we're really at this point where there's just constantly new things coming out new products new technology being developed and in a way that I feel like we take a very kind of thin um, approach to the technology which is that we sort of scratch the surface with it and then immediately move on to the next thing and so we are sort of almost a lot of times living in this kind of novelty layer 
and I'm really curious, like, I, like especially like things like the Connect. Like, I'm really curious when these things stop becoming kind of novel items or novel technology, and instead they kind of disappear a little bit below the surface, and people. Are, um, are using them, but they're not the, actually the main reason people, the audience is interested in the work. Um, you know, I really want to know exactly where someone's fingertip is within a room size space. And, you know, once we can kind of get that sort of level of resolution within the sensing and get better resolution in terms of the immersive technologies, I really, I'm, I want to kind of these things where you do not even think about the technology anymore. It just, everything just feels responsive and magic. Um, I mean, I think we still have a bit of a way to go to get there. Yeah, you seem to be very interested. I think, I think the, you know, the closer you can get to not having to think about how something's happening or why it's happening, um, I think the more kind of engaged you can be with a space. Um, I really like, I like the idea of the technology. I said this like a long time ago, but like computers aren't very sexy. And, you know, so this is like, you know, the ugly stuff. I don't mind if it's like a server room full of computers that are sort of running something, but I don't want anyone to sort of be thinking about that's, you know, how that stuff's working in the background and instead just be kind of completely captivated with the experience. Mm. Over the years, um, when Zach started it at Parsons and then I joined after I left Parsons, it was this very, very small project. And I think for like a year or even maybe two years, we were sort of just working on it, like while I was in Amsterdam and you know, spending maybe 50 or 60% of our time trying to kind of get the tool to a point where people could use it. And if, for a long time, it felt like, you know, why are we doing this? Because like, there, no, there was maybe like five or six people using it, and there wasn't sort of like this kind of huge community like there is now. And then slowly, sort of, it just kind of really kind of grew and exploded. And now it sort of has this momentum and this life of its own where the, commu you know, the community actually sort of drives the tool. And it's, you know, I think, you know, Zach, myself, and Arturo are sort of almost just trying to kind of, kind of guide the process, but a lot of the energy is coming from the people who actually use it now. And that's the part of it where, you know, new work requires new tools. Those new tools then go back into the kind of tool set and then the next person can kind of doesn't have to think about that stuff. They can sort of, you know, think about the next problem. Um, and then, you know, I think, I, you know, in terms of the projects that really inspire, they're often ones that kind of take a completely different approach with sort of how things are presented or kind of a completely different medium. Um, I also like, I just, you know, sort of like projects like a, a lot of uh, Karsten Smith's work where it's like really heavy on the visuals and really kind of, you know, out, you feel like there's some really smart algorithms going on um, and forth. And then also we try as much as possible to sort of blend the generative stuff, you know, the real time dynamic uh, visual aspects with the pre-rendered design and try and make it very hard to see where those two things overlap. Absolutely, yeah of questions of sort of how does sort of the new media art world sort of see itself in relation to sort of more traditional art um, and especially like you know I think in a way new media art is this very organic um, you know it's an organic exploration of new technology and so it often sort of follows technology and often you know kind of branches off in this very kind of random way and that, that probably makes it a little hard to define as a, as a, and so you know, I think the art world's very interested about how this integrates into the art world, and I think a lot, maybe a lot of people who are sort of in doing this stuff doesn't really actually care what the art world thinks of them, and that's sort of an instant. You know, I think a lot of times, people doing this sort of work are more kind of like crazy researchers slash inventors. You know, it's sort of prototyping and sort of like in a way research and development for. The future. So we're almost like kind of creating thing, the future that we would want to experience, and um, and it's it's sort of hard to sort of stop and say, well, am I doing this for like artistic reasons or just because I really want this to be the way things go, or I really like the fact that this stuff exists in the world. That's uh, awesome. Nineties, and so you know, iBeam kind of actually as an institute started more around video art, and I think in that context, people could be. A bit more artistic because video was still a very established, already a very established medium. No one was really interested in it as a medium. Um, so really, the you know it forced that artist in that medium to really kind of go into very conceptual, kind of artistic type uh, 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 paths. And I think you know our 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 field is a bit more focused on the medium. And in a lot of ways, you know, we're constantly exploring new mediums. 
Um, so it does feel a bit more like somewhere between design and research and, um, and maybe with artistic implications and you know that sort of whole new aesthetic kind of uh, ridiculous debate that kind of sprung up over you know this sort of stuff but uh -huh. I think so a little bit like you know I think when I f when when I first graduated from Parsons and start you know was working at IBEAM I think I was really sort of heavily interested in the conceptual um, a bit more into the conceptual ideas behind the work and sort of taking this sort of approach of like you know this is what a new media artist does and they do shows at galleries and you know it's kind of very kind of focused in that traditional art world sense and then actually I realized that it's just way more fun just to forget about all of that stuff and just try and make work that people experience and you know whether it's sort of artistic or if it's more sort of design orientated um, just kind of just come up with an idea and make it and you know some of the good category almost like you know like a lot of the stuff that we post on the fat lab like uh, which is like the free art and technology uh, lab is is usually just like a crazy idea like oh let's like make a plugin that will you know like actually misspell words as you type so it actually kind of adds uh, swear words to your your to your typing so people don't even realize it but they're actually swearing you know in their emails and so like a Tourette's like this idea of like what would it be like to have Tourette's on the internet and that's like you know it's I don't know if it's artistic or anything it's so dumb but it's so much fun to make and it's you know like and it's hysterical you know and sort of like so that there is that sort of weird context especially with kind of internet based projects of you know, it doesn't necessarily have to even know what it is. It's if people f find it amusing or interesting, sort of it has value in that respect. Um, I think, you know, both Emily and myself are really inspired by nature and natural systems and technology up front. Like for us, it's exciting when this sort of technology is hidden behind and the effect is just like magic um, around us. And, you know, if I ever think like, you know, we've managed to do something really cool or kind of highly technical, um, then you just sort of like watch some like undersea, like deep sea documentary and you just kind of completely feel humbled, like, you know, because really what already sort of has been happening for millions of years is, is just far more complex and far more interesting than I think what sort of anyone sort of is attempting to do. And when blowing through it, and when we had that sort of feeling that, you know, the water was like really felt really like it was real water and you could kind of guide it and d dam it and get it to the trees and, you know, you got it to the trees and the trees would sort of bloom and come alive. Like that sort of moment when that we saw that in, in the actual space, um, it, you know, even though we knew how it worked for us, it felt like magic at the time. And, you know, that was that was a, yeah, it kind of was sort of the reason why you want to do this stuff, because it kind of surprises you, even though that's what you're intending for it to happen. Yeah.